microgravity is a stressor to us. So we have evolved in 1G, which is our gravitational forces that affect every single one of our, our bodies. If you change that, either by increasing the stiffening of the extracellular matrix, which happens with aging, that causes mechanical transduction, mechanical sensors in the cell to say there's something going on here. And that signals through many different pathways cause mitochondrial dysfunction, inflammation, aging, and fibrotic response. Okay, that's if you increase tension. Now what we're doing is the opposite. We're unloading the system. The end effect is exactly the same. Welcome to Longevity by Design, a podcast designed to give individuals access to the leading scientific information in the field of longevity. The ability to add years to your life and life to your years needs no opinion. Join us as we ask science to take the wheel. In each episode, Dr. Gil Blander joins a co-host and an industry expert in the field of longevity, shining a light and getting the answers to the key question, how can we live a longer, healthier life? Hello, I'm Ashley Reaver and I'm joined by Dr. Gil Blander. Welcome to Longevity by Design, How to Live a Longer, Healthier Life. We're produced by Inside Tracker, your science-based guide to optimizing your body from the inside out. Our guest today is Dr. David Furman, who will discuss his research, which integrates systems-level immunity in humans to accelerate knowledge of how the immune system affects aging and related chronic diseases. Dr. Furman is the director of the Stanford 1000 Immunones Project at Stanford School of Medicine, associate professor at the Buck Institute for Research on Aging, and chief of the AI platform at the same institute. He obtained his doctoral degree in immunology, summa cum laude, from the School of Medicine, University of Buenos Aires, Argentina, for his work on cancer immune surveillance. During his postdoctoral training at the laboratory of Professor Mark Davis at Stanford, he conducted cutting edge research in data science and systems immunology to predict clinical outcomes using multiomics technology in large human cohorts. Dr. Furman, helped create the systems biology department at the Sidra Medical Research Center in Doha, Qatar. Dr. Furman was then reappointed at the Stanford School of Medicine to assume the role of consulting professor at the Institute for Immunity, Transplantation, and Infection. Dr. Furman's lab utilizes high bandwidth, high throughput technologies to measure immune function in humans and machine learning and AI tools to answer scientific questions with strong potential for translational medicine including the effect of immunity in age-related disease and longevity. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> and thank you for hosting us at your wonderful institute, the Buck Institute. So it's uh, a lot of fun to meet with uh, a, a great scientist face-to-face. Uh, -face. And uh, we always start the podcast with a question about what led you to become a scientist. Why have you decided to be a scientist and not a painter? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I really think that I always had this idea of creating impact in humanity in any way. And so I decided to look into med school and I had this conversation with my dad and said, hey, dad, I want to go and, and do uh, med school and become a doctor. And he took this sentence that I said, I want to create impact. And he said, well, David, as a medical doctor, you can maybe save lives of hundreds of people. But if you really want to create impact in humanity, maybe being a scientist, a biologist, or biochemistry, you know, research will, will, will do better in putting you in that uh, role and in that route. And that really convinced me to go for the scientific route as opposed to the med school. And I still went back to med school, did four years of med school, but dropped out before going to Stanford. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like you have a very smart dad. So uh, he, he provided you a very good uh, uh, advice, advice yeah. in my opinion, at least. Thank you. Um, and uh, then you decided to focus and uh, become a, a work on Im immunology. And why have you decided to go there and not other uh, avenue in uh, biology? Yeah, I think it was early 2000 when there was this idea that inflammation was important for aging and age-related diseases. That blew my mind. We knew about inflammation, you know, cut your finger and it gets red, swollen, but the participation in age-related diseases was something pretty interesting um, because there was this idea that somehow 
inflammation, which is part of the immune system, obviously, drives every single disease of aging. Mm -hmm. And so I said, again, going back to my goal of having impact on humanity, if you solve inflammation, you may solve you know, diseases of aging at large. That brought me to study the immune system and I did a lot of cancer research at first with immunotherapy and vaccines, and then focused mostly on inflammation when I uh, joined the Stanford community. Mm -hmm. And how'd that lead you to where you are here at the Buck? Tell us a little bit about what your lab's researching. Yeah, so I founded the Thousand Immunomes Project with Mark Davis at the, the Stanford School of Medicine back in 2007. So we were doing various omics that were available at that time, a different technology, obviously, than it, it, we, we can see today. After 15 years of running the study with really interesting results, and as part of that was a, the result of a new biological test for systemic chronic inflammation, I founded a company, and uh, Eric Verdain reached out to me and made, made me an irresistible <laughs> offer to take um, a position at the Buck Institute and lead the AI platform Bioinformatics Core. For about five to six, seven years, I trained as a data scientist as well at Stanford with Rob Tipshirani, Trevor Hasty, Daphne Collar, are the big names in computer sciences. And um, so I have so many follow-up questions, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but maybe we'll, uh, uh, let's uh, uh, start uh, with the uh, System biology, computational biology, data science, can uh, you explain to our audience uh, in a relatively simple term what, what is that? And Completely. So systems biology comes from systems theory, of uh, different ways of assessing how a system works. This was an old idea that Bertalanffy in the 40s put forward, and he said that every single system is open. Even cells are open systems. And yeah. so anything that can happen here will have consequences here. We need an interdisciplinary and network analysis to understand how biology works. And so the immune system is complex. It's a very complex system. It has emergent properties that if you study each feature or component in isolation, you'll never be able to understand how that works. And so measuring hundreds of thousands of parameters from the thousand immunomes project that I'm going to allude to, then you have to use systems approaches, machine learning, computational biology, because looking at single feature by single feature in a piecemeal fashion, you cannot really understand how the system works. Can you give us maybe an example of how using that computational biology could apply to aging? I know there's probably a gazillion things you could pull from, but... Maybe just to walk through one of them in a little more detail. Yeah, it's just very challenging to pull from hundreds of thousands of features, the most important ones, sure. if you're not using computational approaches. Uh, it would take you a whole life uh, of a person, uh, maybe met several people, <laughs> to, to get there. We are now using what we call feature selection tools, regularization, machine learning, AI, to automate that. So computers are very good at computing. And so you could find the needle in that haystack. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, you already touched the 1,000 uh, immunosome. Uh, so can you discuss uh, that? And uh, what is that? And what are you trying to achieve? And you, you alluded that uh, before the, uh, your introduction that you're working on that for 15 years. So can you discuss? Uh, Completely. So. When Mark Davis, who I'm expecting he'll get a Nobel Prize for the discovery of the T-cell receptors, which help recognize viruses and cancer cells, uh, he recruited me from a, a congress we uh, went to in uh, Rio de Janeiro in 2007. He said, David, you know, I think we should work together. The work I was doing is mostly using humans. Where, where, where have you been at that time? I was in Buenos Aires finishing my PhD. Okay, so you, you have been a, a graduate student in Buenos Aires. Correct. And then I was uh, presenting my work in this... In the conference. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And got yeah. a job offer. And, and yeah, he <laughs> said, I want to move from studying animals because things don't translate. Mm. So just to give you an idea, for one drug 
to work and be deployed and approved by the FDA, you need around 10 years of research and $2 billion in investment. And the reason is things fail. If you discover things in mice or other animal models, chances are you're not going to be able to find solutions for humans. And so we decided to reinvent immunology and start looking at humans. And the best way to understand human variation is to measure as many things as possible and then use computational models. So we were really, really sick of uh, hearing failure after failure with animal models. We can cure cancer. We can cure autoimmune disease in mice. And I really like this quote from Pedro Lowenstein, who opened a, a plenary session at a cancer meeting, and he said, for the mice in the audience, I have great news. <laughs> <laughs> so that tells you really pretty much everything, yeah. why we focus in humans. And if you study things in humans, discover biomarkers and mechanisms, chances are things will translate into yeah. human solutions for um, extending healthcare. And uh, yeah, so so, but uh, let, let's uh, zoom in even more. Yeah. So you, uh, I assume, uh, collected uh, some uh, 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 samples from one thousand humans, correct? Correct. Uh, what are the samples that you collected? What kind of samples? Right. So we, with these conversations with Mark, we said, well, how do we do this yeah. in the first <laughs> place? And so people come to the hospitals. And we have a great hospital at Stanford. And so why not taking that opportunity for us to bleed individuals and have the most you know, accessible biospecimen that you can get from humans, which is blood. Yeah, I call it a liquid gold, by the way. You're liquid gold, exactly. It's the pipeline of the immune system. Everything's going on yeah. there, and it really represents the health status of an individual. You know that very yeah. well. And so we recruited individuals for a flu vaccine study. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, people come to the clinic, we get a blood draw, your golden material there, and then they get their flu shot and, and, and go out. And then they come back for a, a second visit and we get another blood draw. And this was a longitudinal study. So we collected one, a cohort. We make this uh, a large cohort of a thousand people and two, uh, we're getting all these blood draws. And, and for each one of the blood draws, uh, th these were going into a facility that we formed that's called the Human Immune Monitoring Center that has all the different technologies in a one-stop shop for immune profiling. And so we had you know, a very fast oiled machinery to produce data, and I was lo no longer pipetting at this point. I was just coding and yeah. crunching all those data that will be produced by the facility. And that generated a lot of papers, a lot of insights. And one of the things, as I mentioned before, is this new test for inflammation. Yeah. So, so again, I'm, I'm still in the process. So uh, 1,000 people came to Stanford Hospital, donated some blood, and then you said that they came again and again. So what was the cadence of coming again? There's about 150 individuals that were part of the or original study that was funded partially by Larry Ellison. Okay. And we call that the Stanford Ellison Foundation, the Stanford Ellison Longitudinal Study of Aging, CELA. And so it's about 150 of those that came longitudinally, and we were able to analyze the blood yearly for okay. about now 15 years. Wow. Huh. It's a long study of aging, and we just a couple of years ago received another 18 million from NIH to continue this study for the next five years, partly at the Buck, partly at Stanford, and partly at Technion yeah. in Haifa. Yeah. And, and uh, those uh, uh, 150 or 1,000, are they uh, from a specific uh, demographic or uh, they are a representative of uh, the U.S. population? Well, that's a stretch because they're all Palo Altonians. <laughs> and so you can imagine it's a very geographically and demographically not diverse population. Yeah. They're you know, white, rich people for the most part. Yeah. So it doesn't really represent that much. But it's a very homogeneous population. It's a case for us to study. Yeah. And the requirement was really that the age range was sufficient for us to build models and understand biomarkers and potentially develop therapeutics for aging, yeah. looking at the immune system. So people from all the way from kids to you know, nine, 10-year-old 
to 96, 98. Uh, mm -hmm. So the whole age range, except for uh, exceptional longevity centenarians that we didn't have in the study. Okay. And can you provide to our audience some uh, 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 background of view about what does it mean, uh, immune system? How many protein? How many molecules? What, what is the breast? What is the size of? Incredibly good question. I, there's no good answer for that. There's been some attempts at measuring the whole breadth of how many cell types are out there, how many cytokines or proteins circulate in the blood that are part of the immune system. But as the technologies evolve, we're finding more and more and more. So today we can measure probably 500 different cell types in the blood. Five years ago, we would say only 50. Okay. And so protein-wise, we believe that the whole proteome, which is roughly maybe 20,000 proteins, we can measure in the blood, and largely due to what the immune system produces. Also endothelium cells that are you know, the linen of, of our vessels are producing a lot of those things. But the question is very relevant to the work I'm doing currently. And I'm saying this because many cells in the body can become immune-like. Okay, so the classical description of the immune system by the textbook is not really fitting what's, what we know today. A cell that gets stressed can start to produce inflammatory biomarkers. Yeah. So it's immune-like. Mm -hmm. And so now when you take different organs of the body and you analyze aging profiles, they largely overlap with immune profiles. And maybe it is because there's infiltration of immune cells in different tissues, which we know happens. Yeah. But maybe it's also because the cells in that tissue are becoming immune-like mm. and inflammatory. Many of them are becoming cell senescent cells, senescent cells yes. that they produce inflammatory mediators. So it's a tricky question. And I hope I kind of address it. Yeah, yeah. What, you, what you alluded to, it's a lot. And we are learning every day, we are learning more yeah. because the technology become better. So That's exactly right. We are not sure how many, but it's a lot. It's yeah. many. Or it's many, a, a many. Whole, yeah. yeah. And, and genes, we're estimating maybe 4,500. That are related uh, specifically immune to genes. immune genes. Immune genes. Yeah. So it's uh, 40, uh, 400 out of, let's say, 20 to 30,000, correct? It's about a third of the yeah. whole yeah. Uh, genome. Yeah. It's a big yeah. chunk. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a lot, yeah. Okay. And part of your work, you also discovered some new biomarkers related to the immune system, and that led into the inflammatory age test. That's right. Want to walk us through kind of maybe first discovering some of those biomarkers and then how you developed this test? Right, so part of what we measured, I, I, I say hundreds of thousands of parameters from blood, that includes gene expression, that includes proteins, abundance that are circulating in the blood, cell types, stimulation of different cells in the body. So we had a wealth of data in each one of the individuals in the study. Then we asked the question, which one of these layers of the immune system are best predictors of aging? And we found that proteins were. So then we focused on the proteomics and said, okay, let's build a proteomic clock for aging that can hopefully predict or be associated with disease phenotypes that then we can possibly tackle. And we did exactly that. We use a neural network, a type of nonlinear approximation, it's a type of machine learning method, yeah. to create this new clock of aging based on the immune proteins. And we found that five proteins are by large the best predictors of this inflammatory age. And with that metric, we can correlate with multimorbidity predict frailty before it happens, seven years before it kicks off. Can you off. explain to our audience what is frailty? Frailty, yes, exactly. So frailty is a state of deterioration of your mobility and, 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 and function that's associated with aging. There are many tests of frailty out there. One very common is the time up and go. So the time that it takes for you to stand up in a chair and walk certain distance is a sign of you know, mobility and yeah. quality of your um, musculoskeletal um, system. So that's frailty. We can predict frailty using the immune system seven years before it, it happens. And then there's a lot of other relationships with cardiovascular health 
even with mortality. So we build a surrogate clock in a gene expression for IH, and we can predict mortality in an external data set, the Framingham Heart Study. Yeah. And so that's how we built the, the inflammatory age metric. And your endpoints for aging is the development of frailty, potentially cardiovascular disease, morbidity, other types of comorbidities. Multimorbidity, said, yeah. frailty, cardiovascular, left ventricular hypertrophy, which is basically an undesirable growth of your left ventriculum, yeah. arterial stiffening, not a good thing to have as a predictor of death as well, and mortality. Those are our main endpoints. And what is the use of this clock today? What, what do you use it and what other are using it and what, you, what is your dream? Who should use it other than that? So the test is currently in the last latest phase of development. We haven't launched yet because one thing is to have a result that can be very informative, but it comes from the academia. Yeah. A very different thing, as you will, uh, know well, is to bring it to industry um, yeah. standards. So we've taken, it, t- it, it has taken some time for us to get to that place, and we run a, a trial. We actually run a clinical trial in 750 people who really pushed us back for a product. And so we're now launching any time now in the next few months. And the use, I think it's just, it has to be the general population, mm-hmm. but also has some restrictions in terms of cost. It's out of pocket. And so it's only for people who can pay for it. Yeah. And a lot of different specialties of doctors want to use this. People who know that inflammation is important for cardiovascular disease. So cardiologists are asking us for the test. Yeah. Even dermatologists, yeah. endocrinologists, they, they know inflammation is in the center. So different specialties yeah. and people that want to use it, longevity clinics, biohackers, elite healthcare, concierge yeah. medicine, functional medicine. That's probably a very, very sensitive target because they understand the value of inflammation. And the test is a five a protein a, as a biomarker that comes from a blood test, correct? That is absolutely right. So it's a blood test that we separate the serum yeah. and we use it to analyze these five key proteins yeah. that uh, we measure those proteins and then we run an algorithm on top yeah. and that spits out your inflammatory yeah. age. And so you could have a high inflammatory age or low inflammatory age and that's what gives you the idea of how healthy you are. And can you name the name of the protein, or it's uh, under a uh, uh, trade secret? No, no, they're, they're published in, in our paper. These are proteins that have not been associated with chronic inflammation in the past, because most studies looking at chronic inflammation have focused on acute inflammatory markers. Yeah. They, they're so-called interleukins, interleukin-6. TNF-alpha, the tumor necrosis factor alpha, those proteins participate in the acute response. Yeah. A lot of the uh, scientists out there looking for chronic markers are focusing on these yeah. different factors. We found that they almost have no contribution to inflammatory age. So the proteins that we measure is eotaxin, which is a protein that participates in brain health in the association with aging, right? Because canonical associations are with the immune system to recruit different cell types to go to a site of infection. But this is a a different thing, right? So eotaxin in the context of aging, mostly associated with neurodegeneration and cognitive health. And then CXCL9 is a really important one, which participates in cardiovascular health. We demonstrated that in many, many ways. And then there's three other proteins, interferon gamma, TRAIL, and Mm GROW-alpha that do different things, especially in the context of mounting an immune response. Yeah. So you want to have a healthy immune system, and there's this balance right, between inflammation and the immune system response. Yeah. The more inflamed you are, the lower your immune response is overall to viruses and yeah. vaccines. So, so it's an interesting trade-off that the immune system is actually managing and holding and that. And those five markers are tested, are tested by a normal lab like Quest or LabCorp, or it's a specific test that you develop because they don't test it? 
They don't test it as routine markers, yeah. unfortunately. So we have our own labs yeah. in the area of Georgia, and we really need to have high sensitivity tests because some of these proteins are expressing very low abundance. So we have interferon, for example, you, you'll see a very low abundance of this protein in the general population, so you want to have a sensitive assay. Yeah. So we have our own custom assay that's produced by a third party that we run through our machine yeah. and that spits out the inflammatory agent. And any specific condition that the uh, subject should be or it can go, should you come in the morning, in the evening, uh, after you seek, before you seek? Uh, yeah. uh, so we're, we're, it has to be fasting. Fasting. Yeah, early in the morning, okay. fasting. As we're getting more and more data, we're probably going to understand what are the factors that affect these things. And that's part of the mission we have, mm -hmm. to look for exposome factors. Exposome, I just want to do a quick parenthesis there, is the collection of biological, physical, and chemical exposures that we're suffering throughout our lives core lifespan. And so the exposome will ultimately derive in inflammation. That's what ultimately causes inflammation and accelerated aging. Yeah. And yeah, so to, to your question, I think we want to be sure that we have all the elements under control. But as we get more and more data, maybe we'll find that flying to the East Coast will increase your inflammatory age, things like that. Yeah. And then we can start drawing more, more conclusions. Definitely flying to the East Coast. The West Coast is much more. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like maybe now's a good, we should have started with this maybe, but an explanation from actually an expert in inflammation on what inflammation is, the different types that are there. And as you just alluded to, some of the things that really cause it, because inflammation is such a buzzword now that really gets bastardized, for lack of a better word, to sell a lot of supplements, I feel like. <laughs> yeah. Well, inflammation is the response to a foreign body or stress. This is cellular stress and, and social stress as well. <laughs> but uh, it's an uh, ill-defined term. Mm, I remember maybe four or five years ago, the CEO of my company used to be Wolfgang. And we sat down with Mark Davis and he asked Mark, who is a, you know, a very famous guy in immunology, so can you define inflammation? He said, there's no good you know, definition of it. So we're actually redefining inflammation. We're in the process of writing a whole paper about different types of inflammation. But the main two buckets are acute, and that's a response to infection by large, or cell stress as well. We call those pathogen-associated molecular patterns that are recognized by the immune system, and you mount a response that drives inflammation, and the inflammation is basically to call different immune cells to the site of infection. It gets red, swollen, warm, the cardinal, cardinal signs for acute inflammation. Chronic inflammation and systemic inflammation is different, the one associated with aging. This is mostly sterile. We call it sterile because there's no clear infection associated with it. And what are the causes? Well, first of all, there's no canonical markers for it, except for inflammatory age that we developed. And the causes are the exposome. So the quality of air that you breathe, the quality of water that you, you, know, that you have, the sleep hygiene. And so sleep behavior can cause inflammation for multiple reasons. The circadian rhythm, the immune system follows a circadian rhythm. If you mess up with that, you will cause inflammation. Microbiome, the diversity of microbiome is protective for inflammation. Electrical light, even. We haven't evolved in, a, in, a, in, a, in an environment with electrical light. There's some area in the supercharismatic nucleus in the brain that senses electrical light and really mess up, messed up with your circadian rhythm again. And so pesticides, bad guys, plastics, nanoplastics, microplastics that we're breathing, that we're drinking in water, they cause inflammation by different means. They're hormonal disruptors, and that's one way, but they also cross all the barriers inside the body. They're so small, and they're accumulating in the heart, in the brain. So there's different exposome factors that cause inflammation. And I mentioned social stress. 
that's an important one. So corticoids and the, so in individuals that are chronically ex, um, exposed to social stress, the factors that usually will take care of shutting down the immune system, they're not longer working. Uh, a great case is the caregivers of cancer so patients take cells from those individuals that are inflamed, put them in, a, in the Petri dish, add a bunch of anti-inflammatory molecules, and none of those work. Mm -hmm. They're inflamed because the receptors for glucocorticoids in particular are hidden. You call that desensitization of the... Of, so chronic stress and a, n a number of other factors will, will play into increasing inflammation in the body. So sounds we like... Can we can talk hours about No, this. no, but <laughs> it's, it's good. I think that's very good. And uh, um, what, what I'm hearing from you that... Uh, a lot of the chronic stress coming from uh, our lifestyle right now. And uh, it's the water that we are drinking, it's the food that we are, we haven't discussed the food, but I assume that processed food also increases uh, inflammation. Completely. So, uh, and yesterday we had a, a long discussion about that uh, with uh, another uh, leader scientist. So it sounds like uh, we are actually causing a lot of the chronic stress by our lifestyle. That's right. One important thing to notice is that social isolation that goes with chronic stress also causes inflammation. Mm -hmm. And it's one good predictor of cardiovascular disease in older adults and diabetes and depression in young kids. Mm -hmm. Why are we suffering from social isolation? Well, we know well. There's no good welfare system here in the US. We don't have access to the basic needs that other countries that have resolved that actually show a much better healthcare system and, and health span of the population, Happy, you know, happiness, uh, the sense of community. So in my view, you can do a lot of things with your own body to get to a certain point um, of health, taking care of all these exposome factors and measure yourself constantly using, for example, Insight Tracker or other tools, but the problem is not ended there's a problem out there. You're breathing these things. You're exposed to it. So there's got to be more, I guess, the policymakers need to do something. And there's an interesting thing that's going on. Now, it's a little bit of a deviation of the conversation, but I think it's very relevant because we're, we're, we're putting a lot of effort into understanding the effect of nanoplastics in human health, for example, now. Mm -hmm. And so the United Unions just uh, started this uh, maybe a couple of years ago, 2022, the INC. The INC is the Intergovernmental Negotiation Committee to end completely the plastics entire world by 2040. And so the, it's great, right? There's a lot of um, efforts into this. Yeah. Um, but the last one, which was just now in Ottawa, uh, we still haven't signed agreements. And this is uh, basically we're pushing for a um, binding agreement and there were 200 lobbyists, mm. four times as much as the previous INC, and all for the, from the oil industry. So it's been a, a struggle, and a, we as scientists need to inform these organizations on the effect of the exposome on inflammation, on different biological aging markers, accelerated aging. So all the tools that Inside Tracker actually asked, are offering are very useful for us to understand and be able to inform yeah. these organizations what to prioritize yeah. and what to do. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you because we are looking at, in a way, I call it a free-range humans. So we are looking, we are surveillance, like uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, free-range humans. And this information can uh, uh, show the policymaker what really happened in the uh, in the world in, uh, uh, as an aggregate. And, uh, Completely. Yeah. yeah, it's real world evidence. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, very valuable uh, information. So, so I have a, a, a follow-up question about your uh, uh, inflammation-related clock. Yeah. So I, first, I think that's uh, very exciting, and uh, I really like uh, uh, also the process that you came from unbiased search. It's not like... Uh, when, when I'm talking about inflammation, at Insta Tracker, we're looking at HSCRP, we're looking at white blood cells, and you came with completely different uh, protein, which, which is cool because that's, uh, that's uh, in unbiased. It's not like, uh, yep. th that's first. But second, uh, uh, another point is that uh, today, uh, if you are as, uh, asking or talking with the average consumer, is uh, oh, there are so many clocks. Insta Tracker have our own clock, we call it Zinerage. It's a blood-based clock, but different. 
Uh, you have the epigenetic clock, you have a, a glycan clock. So uh, how do you compare a, a your clock to those? And maybe what are the advantages of your clock on the other clocks? Yeah, I mean, I get this. So a couple of things, and then I want to um, uh, introduce a new thing I'm doing. I'm predicting the future, which is, I think, much cooler in a way and complementary to what we have done at the Thousand Immunomes and Edifice Health, which is my company measuring this inflammatory clock. So the differences and advantages and disadvantages, I guess, if, if any, differences is, one, when you take the epigenetic clock, or maybe glycan age even, you have almost a perfect prediction of your chronological age. Yeah. So there's very little room for biology. What I mean by this is that there's not a lot of variation in individuals. You're yeah. predicting almost perfectly your chronological age, yeah. I, I might as well ask you for uh, your ID. Yeah, th because that's how they trained. That's how they trained, and, and, and because things are very tightly yeah. uh, matching yeah. the chronological age of a person. Yeah. Inflammatory age is much more variable. And people could complain, oh, your clock is not accurate enough. Well, I love that because I can learn about the biology. Yeah. I can take extreme phenotypes that have very high levels of the clock or very low levels, and one, see what they're doing with their lives to see what the exposome yeah. is causing there, but also uh, see what different diseases they can suffer from. So it's a lot of room for biology. That's yeah. one. Right? The second thing that I think is very important of this clock is that having an actionable plan for epigenetic clocks is a stretch. I'm not saying it's impossible, but we know so little about the different epigenetic marks that are giving that clock a signal that it's almost impossible to predict what to do. Yeah. Similar to glycan age. These are glycans in IgGs and that are circulating in the blood, and we know very little on how to action it. Whereas if you have proteins, you know what those proteins are, yeah. those are, proteins are doing. Yeah. Uh, and so you know there are certain things that you can do to decrease the level of those proteins, bring them to an optimal level, and obviously extend your health span yeah. as you do that. So, yeah, so actionable, that, actionable, actionable right. insights and also the possibility to understand more yeah. of the biology. So, so I want to double click on that because I think that that's a very good point that not everyone understands. So let me try to explain it in my world and correct. please correct me if I'm yeah. wrong. So, so what David said is, and, and by the way, I agree with that 1%, is that uh, epigenetic age that is calculated based on a modification of a colmethylation of a CPG island on your DNA is very cool, very accurate, but we don't understand what, what is the effect of methylation of specific location in, the, in your DNA. And because of that, we cannot come and say, your, this location is methylated 50% versus 70%, then you need to eat more of that or, or drink less of that. So basically, it's very accurate, it's very interesting, but it's not actionable. You cannot do a lot of that. And the, similarly to the glycan age, and I agree with you, while protein-based uh, clock, like what you developed with the five very interesting protein that you found, or something that uh, we have today at Insta Tracker that is based on protein, we know so much about those proteins, there are thousands or maybe tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of uh, papers, that then you can come and say, okay, P, which is a marker of inflammation, is high, that means that uh, if you eat this food or uh, drink this drink or you change your lifestyle or exercise, you have a better chance to optimize this marker and by that improve your age. That, that's fair to say? Yes, absolutely. You Well put. Yeah. It's exactly what I was alluding to. Yeah. 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 A again, I, I agree with you 1% on that, but I, looking in the future, I assume that uh, I don't know, in 10 years, 20 years, those epigenetic clock might... We might understand more and they will be better, but as of today, no doubt that we don't know what we, to do. We are starting, which is quite cool. Yeah. The distance uh, of those CPG marks on certain genes will, can inform gene expression. Yeah. We're starting to have certain algorithms that can predict expression of genes, either increases or decreases in the expression of the genes based on methylation patterns. Yeah. 
So we're starting to get there, but we're far from 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 being there already. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. As a Longevity by Design podcast listener, you understand the value of improving your health for today and for all the years ahead. And if you want to live your healthiest, longest life possible, you need to understand what's going on inside. At Inside Tracker, we take a personalized approach to health span optimization that eliminates guesswork from your wellness plan. Inside Tracker analyzes blood biomarker and DNA data, along with physiomarker data from fitness trackers like Aura Ring, to deliver personalized food, supplement, lifestyle, and exercise recommendations that allow you to take control and improve your health span. And for a limited time, Longevity by Design listeners can get 20% off at the Inside Tracker store. So if you're ready to receive a personal health analysis and data-driven wellness plan to optimize your body for the long haul, then it's time to start inside. Visit insidetracker.com slash podcast to get started today. That's insidetracker.com slash podcast to get started today. I remember in one of the conferences of scientific conferences of aging, I spoke with one of the leader in the epigenetic age and the he, he showed uh, some location of uh, methylation and I asked him, okay, that's mean that this gene will uh, transcribe or not? And he said, I'm not sure about yeah. that. Even it's... that, like you have a, a methylation very close to the promoter and you are Exactly. Not... Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's a new study that has shown uh, a method that can potentially be used to this, to tackle this question, but it's not, you know, we're not there yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And for inflammatory age, you were saying you're hoping to be future kind of oriented or future facing with that. So using it as a way to prevent these chronic diseases of aging, how do you see like well, that happening? So that's, a, I guess, a third very important point, which is we know that inflammation is, is the cause of different diseases of aging. And so if we can prevent the inflammation from, from, from increasing or even uh, reverse that, you know, you have, I think, a huge amount of opportunities to decrease the burden of mm-hmm. chronic disease in the population. Sure. Whereas if you're looking at other markers, uh, it's not very clear. But we know inflammation is a biggie, and everybody knows that today, I guess most people. And so I think there's room for improving the health span and the lifespan of the population worldwide if there's an adoption of this test and actionable insights. And doctors could say, oh, you know, we are not in the, like, my company is not in that business of saying what people should do, but the doctor should, and they should interpret things in yeah. the right ways, and maybe in the future we'll be there with maybe different supplementations that can bring down expression of these proteins, and also lifestyle recommendations based on, you know, the literature, what has been most effective at, let's say, lowering your toxin. Yeah. The best example is a study we did with a corporate partner where we measured eotoxin and inflammatory age in a clinical study that they did with this. It's a beta-glucan-rich compound. And it turns out in two weeks, we lower inflammatory age in the population and we lower eotoxin. There's so many companies, pharma companies, trying to target eotoxin. And just by having this supplement that ha- that is rich in beta glucan is it in a natural compound yeah. that can do the job or oatmeal that's our favorite yeah. recommendation yeah. <laughs> i didn't want to go there I didn't wanna go. <laughs> yeah but but yeah i mean there there are some of these things that can be implemented in ways that are you know immediate today and that don't necessarily need hardcore like drugs yeah. or you know crazy pharma interventions so the research we don't necessarily have enough research to specifically target these five not yet but not that's yet the goal. but it's, it's it's the goal okay yeah. it's definitely the goal one using corporate and other institutions that can help us do the r&d but also most importantly as you're growing your database and you know this well Jill, is you're going to be able to see which factors are affecting protein a b and c yeah. using real world evidence and then go back and say okay you should avoid this or promote this. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So w- one more uh, point. So you you, you uh, gave us a very good uh, um, viewpoint of what uh, um, um, substances are actually increasing in inflammation, and we discussed it uh, very deeply. Uh, my uh, question or viewpoint is that also the aging process increases inflammation. So you can see if you compare uh, someone that is in the is in error is 20 versus someone that is in 50, most likely the inflammation will be higher. So the question is, 
Is it because I got more exposed to the plastic or uh, uh, to the bad water or the pesticides, or is it because uh, my internal system working less efficient, and, or is it both? It's both. We've seen the Nature Aging paper we published in 2021 demonstrates it's both. If you just age cells, they start to produce inflammatory biomarkers, the ones that we identified in the study. CXL9 being the poster child for, for this thing. Okay. So as you age cells, solely the process of aging the cell, that cell will start producing CXL9. Now, when you add on top the exposome, then you have the double whammy, yeah. which is you know, exposome plus aging, that gives you your high risk profile. So, so that it's good to know because what you are saying is it's an additive effect. If it, uh, it's very hard for us to, to control the aging process, but uh, we can control the water that we are drinking, the food that we are eating, the, the air that we are breathing Completely. and so on. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so that's maybe a one take-home message for our audience. Uh, be careful about that. Exactly, yes. <laughs> you can't do so much about your own chronological yeah. aging. You know, it's, it's the time that uh, goes by, yeah. but definitely you can, you can do a lot by taking care of your exposome in yeah. different ways. I'm actually putting together uh, a book that talks about this. Just a summary of it is that every species that is moved to a new environment will develop inflammation. Mm. And as a, coral, a corollary, of that, corollary of that, the more distant you are from your evolution, evolutionary experience, the more inflamed you'll be. Mm -hmm. So let's think about the way we evolved. Try in this world to adapt to that reality. Eat healthy foods, you know, free from pesticides, stay away from plastics. Try not to change your uh, time zones and you know, it's, it's, it's a curse of what I do, but, yeah. you know, try to <laughs> minimize that effect. Yeah. You know, work shifts are, are really, really bad in terms of, you know, rising your inflammatory levels. And you can control all those things. But we definitely need more policy and inform, you know, governments and other organizations because there's other things that they can do to help not just us, but humanity as a whole and other species. Imagine... All the species have, are, are receiving what we produce, and they have accelerated aging as well. Yeah. So we know about the harm that we're causing in the oceans, and the most pristine, supposedly pristine areas in the world are packed mm -hmm. with micro and nanoplastics. Yeah. So there's more policy that needs to be implemented, and, but definitely you can do a lot already with your own health to protect yourself from those exposome factors. What about if we talk about long-lived humans, so our centenarians, is there anything that you know pops out to you for these inflammatory markers? Like we, we've you know talked to a lot of experts, obviously, near bars of life, saying those people just don't necessarily avoid all of the bad parts of the yeah. exposum, so to speak, but yeah. they still make it to 104. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And near is a good friend. I really like uh, the work uh, that he's doing. And he discovered and there's a few genes that seem to be associated with exceptional longevity. There's a microbiome that's very peculiar. There's a type of CD4 T cells that are circulating there. But I think all these papers are telling us it's pretty stochastic. In other words, in order for you to be a centenarian, it can come from many different ways, not necessarily inflammation. Although we have in a study, we have a part, part of the uh, Nature Aging paper has a 19 centenarian cohort that we obtained from the collaborator in Bologna. We run the inflammatory age test in these individuals, and the difference between their calendar age and inflammatory age is around 40. Mm. So they're, they're below the average 40 years, uh, 40 years oh. protected wow. from inflammation. Now, the variance is huge. Some people show exactly their age. Some people, it's like 80 years below. So it's a huge amount of variability, which, again, tells us that there are many ways to, you know, in order to, to many pathways yeah. that are in place for someone to be a centenarian. It could be microbiome, it could be immune system, it could be 
you know. So, so they are lucky in a way, quite. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> put it that way. Uh, yeah. But if you uh, have been born to a centenarian uh, parents, you are even lucky. You all will be. Yeah, still well, lucky. there are certain genes again, yeah. and yeah. I think the work yeah. that Nir has been doing is focused on, on the genetics of, of, yeah. of the Ash- Ashkenazi Jews that live yeah. for a long time. Yeah. But also, there's a lot of confounding factors. Yeah. I mean, we generally they eat relatively healthy. They're very intellectual. You know, they, they're more, I guess, educated. Ashkenazi Jews have this uh, heritage of being very intellectual and being in these circles of you know, reading a lot. So yeah. you obviously have confounding factors. Yeah. But yeah, I think it's a collection of different things that can contribute to be a centenarian, for someone to be a centenarian. So you have done some work, uh, exciting work, I think, about risk associated with the space flight and inflammation. So... Can you yeah. elaborate on the? How have you got this specimen there? Yeah, yeah. This is the, the the newest stuff we're doing, and I think it's probably the coolest. So, for three and a half years ago, during the pandemic, a principal investigator at the Human Research Program in Houston, NASA, Houston, reached out to me and said, "David, the immunome that you're studying and the relationship with aging is so um, appropriate for us to understand aging in space." and develop countermeasures to protect our astronauts. That blew my mind. I had no idea that astronauts are actually suffering from different physiological mm-hmm. aging processes. Mm-hmm. I wanted to be an astronaut when I was a kid, but it has nothing <laughs> to do with it. Everyone. Exactly, it's everybody. <laughs> but that opened a number of different opportunities within NASA. We got a NASA grant outside of NASA. We started collecting samples from Inspiration4, mission, the mission with uh, SpaceX, my collaborator there is Chris Mason at Cornell. And after three or four meetings with Susie Sanello, which is the PI at NASA, I, I f- realized that she was suffering from a terminal cancer. Mm-hmm. Mm. So she wanted to really pass the torch, and, and she chose me. And so I felt this is a mission for me. This is a you know, life mission. And uh, this I, take, I, I took it to, <clears throat> to the next level, which is... Let's start to understand accelerated aging in astronauts. And so we had all the data from the NASA studies, the twin study, JAXA-6, that's the Japanese uh, agency, and Inspiration4, which is the SpaceX mission. And then we envision a way to bring space to Earth. Mm -hmm. And so there are ways to simulate microgravity on the ground on Earth. There's two instruments, one that was developed by NASA engineers that's basically keeping the cells in constant free fall. Mm. It's like weightlessness, just like what you have in the International Space Station. And so we have organoids, which are little mini hearts and mini brains that we can build in the lab, put them in the microgravity simulator machine, and accelerate the aging of those biospecimens by about five to 10 years in 24 hours. Wow. Wow. It's shocking. Not only we do that, we can develop diseases. We have a model for Parkinson's disease in brain organoids. We have a model for cardiomyopathy Mm -hmm. in heart organoids. And we also take immune organoids from tonsils, from real, real, real people. We put them in microgravity and you have accelerated aging. Why do we want to accelerate the aging? right, in the first place. Well, because we don't have to wait for five or ten years until we run this long study. We can actually test for interventions in a high-throughput manner. We can test for supplements. We can test for drugs. And we can obviously uh, derive biomarkers. What are the things that change in microgravity? So that led to the creation of my second company, and that's called Cosmica. And the idea there is to offer individuals just like you, a window for how you will age in the next five years, Mm. which may be different from your aging. Maybe your aging will be largely driven by cellular senescence. Maybe yours will be a loss of protostasis. And so we have that window. We call that the older twin, the future, the future you. And so we're using that as a model for understanding how someone will age. So technically, you're taking a, a few cells from this person, uh, put it in the uh, uh, microgravity, and then see how fast they age and what are the markers for this age. That's, That's exactly right. Yeah. What are the different mechanisms yeah. of aging? 
and we're going to commercialize that through longevity clinics and uh, it's it's more of a luxury product because yeah. it's quite expensive i assume so yeah, <laughs> yeah. there's basically three tiers one you can age the blood two you can screen compounds in your age cells mm -hmm. and i can tell you very precisely which one will work for you yeah and three older twin and the older twin is all the organoids a physical representation of a person that i can age in the machine yeah. and see what works yeah wow. and and have you seen in the astronauts so i assume that you have but uh, ju just to be sure so astronaut that they are going to space, I don't know, space station for 180 days. So before and after, what happened to their immune age? So first of all, we know from epidemiological studies that they have a reactivation of latent viruses which means you have a decrease in your immune response. Yeah. So, so just to explain to our user, latent virus, you have a lot of latent virus in your genome and they are uh, jumping out and become a real virus, that's what you're? Yeah, exactly, so some of the viruses are latent, they hide in the bone marrow, yeah. and, and they're, you know, they're not doing anything bad yeah. to you until you have an you know, immune compromise. Yeah, so they find the opportunity and they're jumping out and starting to... Yes, yeah. yes, so there's reactivation of these viruses during space flight mm -hmm. and so that tells you that your immune system is going down mm -hmm. and you have inflammation it's very very well known you have mitochondrial dysfunction at the level of um, molecular aging you have an acceleration of almost all hallmarks of aging at the level of physiology they have fivefold increase in cardiovascular disease across the life during the life course so increased risk mm -hmm. of cardiovascular mm -hmm. cognitive deterioration loss of uh, bone and muscle mass mm -hmm. and uh, frailty that's basically and so it's a really good model for us to see aging in humans yeah. I think it's a perfect model for accelerated aging in humans without a disease right because some lines of evidence have shown that different diseases can cause accelerated yeah. aging HIV yeah. being one uh, progeria well, those are genetic diseases yeah. you know, and not really representative of the normal population. So this is healthy people that go in space and accelerate their aging, and we see these samples before and after. And, and what should be the time in, uh, in space? Uh, one day is enough, or it's uh, one week, or one month? Right. Yeah, yeah. So based on the data we've collected so far, we've seen that the accelerated aging is about 30-fold. So for each year you spend in the International Space Station, you'll age about 30 years on the ground. Wow. wow. That doesn't mean they don't recover. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay, okay, so you go back to Earth. And there's natural mechanisms that are put in place, rejuvenation mechanisms, which is super cool because you study that return. Yeah. Mm. You're having natural compounds that are put in place to rejuvenate the system. So we're doing that as well. But bottom line, many of the soft endpoints can recover quite quickly. Things like remodeling of your heart may take 10 years to recover. That is in whole organisms, whole humans in space. If you do that in the lab, for every 25 hours that we spin the cells, we accelerate 5 to 10 years biological age, mm. give or take, measured by biological aging clocks. Now, the ultimate experiment, which is one that we did, is you take cells from an individual that blood draws were taken five years apart. So real aging, mm -hmm. not a surrogate biological aging clock. Yeah. a real aging, and put the first sample in microgravity and see if that resembles the last sample. We have 95% confidence that microgravity retains that individual variation and predicts the, the five-year later time point. Nice. And yeah, is it sample. because gravity, like the pressure puts on the body, relieving that pressure is a stressor to cells? Yes, microgravity is a stressor to cells. So we have evolved in 1G, which is our gravitational forces that affect every single one of our, our bodies. If you change that, either by increasing mm. the stiffening of the extracellular matrix, which happens with aging, that causes mechanical transduction, mechanical sensors in the cell to say there's something going on here. And that signals through many different pathways cause mitochondrial dysfunction, inflammation, aging, and fibrotic response. Okay? That's if you increase tension. 
Now what we're doing is the opposite. We're unloading the system. The end effect is exactly the same. Mm. So we have evolved in 1G, if you go above or below, you're going to cause aging. Yeah. So I assume that also fighter pilots that go to a, a higher G or lower G, they suffer the same problem? There's very little data, okay. very, very little data. And, and that's the same problem with astronauts. Yeah. I mean, when I say epidemiological findings, yeah. we're talking about maybe a sample size of 10. Yeah, <laughs> I, I spoke with a direct, one of the directors of NASA, and I spoke, okay, how many astronauts have you done in the history of the NASA? Yeah. And they, I think that he said 450 yeah. or something. Oh, like yeah. That. And I think that it's all over the world. It's not only NASA. That's so exactly right. Yeah, that's, that's more accurate. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, there's not a whole lot. We're actually recruiting. So if you know any astronauts, send their <laughs> way. I, I uh, met we one. Have, we have, we have a, a study to, to look to see. This is, it's a little bit of a compl complicated study. We're going to send one astronaut to the International Space Station and collect lumbar function. So it's a little bit kind of risky procedure. And the idea is to measure biomarkers of a particular condition that has to do with uh, intracranial pressure and they have a lot of ocular vision issues. Yeah. Let's put it in simple terms. And so we're trying to recruit astronauts, been for like four years now trying to recruit astronauts, not a single one has signed up for. Mm -hmm. So it's quite tricky to do studies. Um, yeah. But luckily we have you know, a way to simulate microgravity on the ground yeah. and use cells and, and different organoids to assess uh, the effects of microgravity. And you also mentioned uh, traveling in time zones. Is it only the time zone or also uh, like a, a flight attendant that uh, spent a lot of time in the airplane and there also the, uh, the gravity is not the same? As no, no, the, the gravity will remain constant. That, that's not a, a something that will affect normal. You know, if you're within LEO, you're, which is the low Earth orbit, and you're taking a flight to whatever, you're, 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 you're good. The, okay. the same. So it's mostly the time in, in, in the, the change edge? of the time zone okay. in the time zone that will re be really, really bad for okay. you. Right? So, so time, yeah. work shift. And I time assume work. that it's also the radiation. You have much more. No, than... again, so if you're within the low Earth orbit, you don't have more. You're, than... No, you're, you're largely protected okay. from okay. any co cosmic rays okay. or galactic rays. Okay. If you go above and beyond Leo to the moon or Mars, uh, that's a completely yeah. separate story. You're going to have a lot of DNA damage caused by heavy particles that are coming from the sun. Yeah. These are yeah. cosmic rays. Yeah. They're very harmful. Yeah. It's different. Okay. Uh, if you're within LEO, which is the, you know, uh, inter ISS, the International Space Station is within LEO, okay. you're mostly suffering from lack of gravitational forces yeah. as opposed to gravity radiation. So future colony on Mars, lots of things to think about. Yes. You might get there, but you might not last very long. Yes, yes. Uh, I've been called to talk to folks at NASA and see if we can develop countermeasures for a space wow. uh, flight to Mars. And we, the, 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 the biggest uh, concern is the DNA damage response that you yeah. need to boost. Mm. And, and it's a whole different monster too. <laughs> and, and all this story made me much, much less excited to become an astronaut. <laughs> <laughs> or just to go, yeah, you know, for a go, few minutes yeah. as a, yeah. as a I, tourist. I won't join uh, Elon Musk and go to, <laughs> yeah. uh, to the Mars with him. Yeah. Well, unless, I mean, if I take your cells and I can measure what is your response to microgravity yeah. in my lab, I can maybe you know, give you a supplement or something yeah. before you fly out and you'll be protected. Yeah. We are not there yet, but that's one of the goals. Yeah, so. makes sense. That sounds like you have your hands in lots of things, but is there something you're really excited about in your work in the future or a big goal that you have for your work? Yeah, I mean, all of the above. I, I, I'm passionate, so that, that means I'm, I'm really excited about all of the above, um, but uh, recently with the development of um, supermassive language models, um, like the Gemini from Google and Megatron, Turing from NVIDIA, that are coming up this year. It's mm -hmm. very recent. I've been uh, thinking, and I hired a computer, computer scientist um, to help me get there, to use those language, large language models and read and try to extract relevant information from the literature that can tell us what are the exact contributions of each one of the 
exposome factors to accelerated aging, to inflammation, to diseases, because we have no clue. We know many of these things are bad, but when I, you know, I'm asked the question, can you prioritize? Is it social stress worse than you know, sleep or you know, microbiome or the croissant I had this morning? Yeah. You know, and I said, I don't know. We cannot measure that. We would need multi-billion dollar study, well control, or you know, take these supermassive large language models to extract relevant information from the literature and be able to inform policymakers, government, and so on for the new longevity cities that they're starting to appear in different parts of the world, Switzerland, mm-hmm. London, Honduras, Italia, different longevity cities that want to improve the health span of individuals, but we don't really know what to prioritize. Yeah. Okay. So I'd like to get there. I think it's going to be revolutionary. Yeah. Very excited about that point. Yeah, so it was a, a very cool discussion. We, we, we started with uh, what is inflammation, and we got uh, to LLM, which is... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and we cover a lot in between, from uh, space to uh, airplane to... So, yeah, a very exciting and uh, a good discussion. And uh, uh, we, we used to uh, finish the, uh, um, the interview by uh, one question about... Uh, what is a, a what is your recommendation for someone that would like to live uh, better longer? What what can he or she do today in order to try to get to that uh, phase? What would you recommend them? Yeah, I think it, it's a tricky question, but I'm going to try to simplify. As I said before, if you are far away from your evolutionary experience, you'll be inflamed, you'll develop diseases, right? So try to eat natural unprocessed foods, try to stay away from plastics, from pesticides, sleep well, and for the most, I mean, very, very importantly, track. Track what those changes are doing to your body. How do you track these things? Yeah. Well, there's a number of companies, one is interest tracking, but there's a number of companies that you can use and different tests that you can administer yourself or by your doctor to see which one of those factors are improving your health the most. And so measure, measure, measure yourself longitudinally and, and try to stay away from all these triggers of inflammation. Awesome. I have to just say I really appreciate your explanation of inflammation, that there's not a good definition. I feel like that's a great example of the more you know, the more you realize what you don't know. And Gil and I are constantly yeah. humbled by experts like yourself that come on the podcast just to yeah. remind us that we don't really know anything, even though we think we know a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. So that's what makes things exciting too, right? Exactly. That's what we're doing yeah. science. That's why I'm here yeah. in this institute, which is uh, really great. And here the communities is, is really terrific. So it's a lot of collaborative environment uh, for everybody here to try to push the boundaries, understand inflammation, understand aging in different aspects, biomarkers, interventions. So I think this is a great place to get there, to, to improve the life and, and, and health of the population. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Terrific. Thanks for listening to Longevity by Design. Please subscribe to this podcast on Apple, Spotify, or YouTube. Longevity by Design is powered by Inside Tracker a personalized health optimization platform that helps people improve their lives by improving their bodies from the inside out using personalized, science-backed recommendations for nutrition, supplements, and lifestyle changes. To learn more, visit InsideTracker.com slash podcast.